Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer. It's another friendly reminder to sign up for our event coming up December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd this year. <laughs> uh, right here in Santa Barbara. We're going to have a Friday night open house and, and Sunday afternoon open house for those of you who can't make it Friday night. Right here at the Skeptic Society, Skeptic Magazine office. Um, it will provide food and drinks. It's going to be big fun. And then Saturday and Sunday, I've got a, we've got a bunch of great events um, set up for you. Most interestingly, I wanted to tell you about uh, Pete Bogosian. I've known Pete for a long time now. He's a longtime good friend. Uh, and that he's developed this really interesting uh, process he calls street epistemology, in, in which he goes around uh, talking to people just in various places. He's been in Europe for months now. Uh, doing this, in which he brings up controversial issues and just sees what it would take for people to move from their current position to some other position. For example, he would just ask, what would it take to change your mind? This is one of the great questions. Anyway, Pete will be here uh, with his own film crew as well. So we're going to do a bunch of this um, right there on the stage. You will be participating in this. That is, he's going to bring some of you up and say, ask you, if you're an atheist, what would it take for you to be an agnostic? What would it take if you moved even further to deism or fideism or maybe even theism? What would it take for you to be convinced that there is a God? Huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, that's going to be super interesting. So check it out. Go to skeptic.com. Click on the banner. Sign up December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Uh, we have the Saturday night uh, fundraising dinner. Sunday morning with Jared Diamond. Saturday with Michael Schellenberger and Pete Bogosian. Can't wait to see you. All right. Bye-bye. All righty, everybody, it's Michael Shermer, and it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show, brought to you by the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine. Here we are. There's a lot of online magazines now. Almost anybody could do it. But can you have a print magazine that actually has four color on the inside, beautifully designed? This is our latest issue on educational matters, that is, educational reform, what we need to do, standardized tests, and so on and so forth. You can pick it up at your local bookstore, or you can go to skeptic.com and just Click on magazine and order it there. And if you support our uh, nonprofit educational organization efforts here, like the podcast, you can go to skeptic.com slash donate and give us a little love there. Okay. My guest today, the returning champion, Daniel Dennett. He is <laughs> university professor emeritus at Tufts University and the author of numerous books, including Intuition Pumps and Other Tools for Thinking, Breaking the Spell, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Consciousness Explained, among other titles. Here's his new book, a memoir called I've Been Thinking. It's such a great title, Dan. I love Thanks. that. <laughs> yes, it seems to fit you so perfectly. All right, I'm going to start off here. I'm going to uh, kick this off with a little passage from your page, whatever this is, three or four, I think, on the role of luck. So you start off here writing, which uh, I really appreciate it because I was there at this event. I once participated in a weekend gathering in Seattle of very smart high school kids. That was Adventures of the Mind, Vicki Gray's event, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, designed to inspire them to great achievements. There was an all-star cast with several Nobel laureates, the novelist Amy Tan, the Google Boys, Sergey Brin, and Larry Page. That was before Google was huge. That was before yes. their IPO. <laughs> that was amazing. And the glass sculptor, Dale Chaluli. We got to go out to his uh, factory there where he makes all those beautiful... Gulps. What struck me about the 15-minute talks each of us gave uh, to these attentive youngsters was that most of us focused on the role of luck. We had just happened to be at the right place at the right time, found the right mentors, made a few lucky stabs in the dark. This intense modesty was meant to put them at ease, but wouldn't it have had an unintended side effect? Don't think there's a reliable path to progress. Just wing it. And if you're lucky, you'll end up like us. <laughs> All right, Dan. What's the role of luck in your path to where you are now? Well, we're all lucky. But then every blade of grass is lucky. 99.9% .9 of all the things that have ever been alive have died childless. But no blade of grass that you can see today has that fate, nor do us. All of our ancestors <laughs> had, had children, which is puts them in an extremely tiny uh, <laughs> minority of all the things that have lived. I mean, the whole idea of luck is, uh, is, is a sort of philosophical mess. Yes, we're lucky. Some of us are much more lucky than others. And, and, uh, but luck is not a projectable predicate, as a philosopher would say. 
if you're going to have a, a a coin toss to settle some big question like who gets to control Crimea, you might think, well, let's have a coin toss in Geneva and settle it. So who should we send to, to uh, on our side? Well, we could have a we could have a giant elimination tournament of coin tosses. And whoever won that coin toss would have won, you know, 25 in a row or something like that. Uh, is that the person to send? No. <laughs> no, because l- luck isn't, isn't that kind of property. It's luck. <laughs> so uh, uh, no reason to think that that person would be any better at calling the big coin toss than anybody else. You right here. I have so far led a remarkably adventurous and fulfilling life, way beyond the most extravagant fantasies of my youth. And I was a cocksure young man with vaulting ambition. How did it happen? Was it all just luck or connections? Or may I claim some credit for getting myself into the current happy state? Do I, in a sense, deserve the benefits I now enjoy? Okay, we'll say into free will in a, in a little bit, but I like your quote here that your mentor at Oxford, uh, Gilbert Ryle, uh, told you, or you told a colleague of mine over a few beers in Salzburg back in the 1960s, quote, there are much deeper chaps than Dennett, but he has a fire in his belly. <laughs> okay, so the question is, where does the fire in the belly come from? Uh, that's probably just luck. I mean, I uh, have just always wanted to explain things and understand things, and I'm not afraid to ask questions. And uh, it turns out that's a very important thing to do. Uh, if you, uh, it, as I reflect back, I mean, the the point of my book, in a way, was to ask, how on earth did I do this? <laughs> and and the fact is, if you don't look back and think about it, you're going to come up with some false answer about how you did it. And as I look back and think about it, I think, well, I was lucky to fall in with some really smart people. And then I was lucky enough to ask them a lot of good questions and get them to take me seriously. And then it's just been collaboration ever since. Um, the ultimate Tom Sawyer whitewash fence trick. I, I've, mm-hmm. I've been been tutored and coached by, by my lights by some of the smartest people in the world. I've had a, I've had a trillion dollar education uh, uh, that I didn't have to pay for. Uh, uh, but uh, largely because I was ready to learn that I was wrong and make mistakes and blurt something out just to get something on the table to talk about. Yeah, our, our mutual friend Michael Gazaniga talks about the, uh, what does he call it, the left hemisphere um, storyteller or narrator or something like that. That yeah. that That is, we have this sequence of things that happens, most of it's largely random, and then our brain kind of draws a thread between all the individual events after the fact, the hindsight bias, yeah. and makes some plausible story of why this had to happen this way and not some other way. So I'm wondering when you set out to write your memoir, uh, you know, you're conscious of this. Did you think, okay, I better double check with my wife and friends that this actually happened the way I think it did. But even if you did that, there's still kind of a sense of yeah. looking back and go, oh, okay, here's how each contingent step ended up. It, it, it feels inevitable looking back, but it wasn't that way at all. Oh yeah. There's, um, and we tend to forget our mistakes, which is a good thing because otherwise <laughs> we'd be very depressed. Uh, uh, by the way, it, it occurred to me just Yesterday, the day before, as I've been thinking about this, um, you know what? You know one of the big differences between art and science is that artists get to cover up their mistakes. <laughs> Scientists have to make their mistakes in public, mm. and not doing that, cherry picking, is a sin in science. Not a sin in art. You can make hundreds of sketches and throw them out. You can. You can make paintings that you throw away or that you repaint. Nobody cares. That's fine. You you only get to show the, the your final approved, cherished, best effort. But not so in science. Not so in science. You you, you gotta you gotta show all your work. And and 
That's one of the great strengths of science, but it also means that scientists have to take their lumps. They have to say it in public, and they have to be able to admit when they're wrong, and they have to recognize that while they're saying it in public, they may be caricatured, they may be misrepresented, they may be subjected to abuse. The, the, the fighting edge, the cutting edge, the fighting edge in any science can be pretty rough and tumble, and uh, people can get hurt. Uh, but I think it has to be that way. Well, that's an ideal, of course. The, going through the replication crisis starting around 2010, we realized that there was a lot yeah. of you know, selective bias, file drawer Absolutely. problem, p-hacking, and so on. But would you then say, well, yeah, but it was scientists that uncovered those problems and trying to fix them now? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to point that out to um, religious apologists. I say, um, you're great at pointing out uh, the mistakes that science has made and the biases and the prejudices. But how do you know about those things? You know about it because science lays it all out there bare. Who discovered those, those failures, those plagiarisms, those p-hackings? Scientists did. I don't see religion doing that. I don't see any religion that, that, that advertises its failings. Science has to. Yeah. I think if science is a branch of philosophy rather than two different things, would you say that philosophy as a field uh, has similar uh, moral norms about truth-telling and fact-checking and falsification and so forth? It certainly should. Um, I think that uh, philosophy is... There should be a place where... Uh, any, anything goes where where any rule is up for debate and further discussion, and, and pretty much that's philosophy. Um, years ago, um, when I used to spend a lot of time hanging out at the AI lab at MIT on the top floor of Tech Square, and they had a, a big room there called the Playroom, uh, and there were, you know, uh, beanbag chairs and other assorted amusements and funny cartoons on the wall, the playroom. And that's where a lot of the best thinking happened. Uh, and I think that science needs to have playrooms where people try out half-baked ideas, uh, uh, dangerous ideas, and people can speak candidly and try to turn those into baked ideas. Uh, yeah. uh, my, my friend Simon today at the, at the Santa Fe Institute, one of my favorite hangouts, uh, uh, started a, a series he called the Dangerous Ideas Seminars on Friday afternoons, where you were, uh, if it was your turn to hold forth, you were supposed to come forward with a half-baked idea, not a full-baked idea. No, it had to be a half-baked idea. It had to be something that you weren't sure of. And then the rule was, we build, we don't criticize. The, the, the joke rule was, you, you can't say but. <laughs> well, of course, you could say but. But the, the, the point was to try to help the baker bake the idea into something really presentable rather than just tear it down. Philosophers spend a lot of time tearing each other down uh, because that's sort of the best they can do very often. Yeah, well, I guess I'm referring to people that are not philosophers that say, you know, there's no progress in philosophy or philosophy is dead. You've been tangled with a few of these, Lawrence Krauss and I think Neil deGrasse Tyson, maybe even Stephen Hawking. Uh, I, I recall... Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Leonard Maladnow in his memoir of, of his relationship with Stephen, um, you know, in the grand design, they had that line in there, philosophy is dead. <laughs> and yeah. Len tells the story of how that came about, it, that, you know, Stephen said, wrote that in his little, you know, uh, computer voice and so on. It took a while to write it out. 
And Len said, we can't say that. That's not true. And he goes, well, what would you say? So Len writes out this like paragraph long thing. And Stephen says, uh, I don't like that sentence. My sentence is way punchier. That's what we're going with. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like a punchline. How do you respond to that? Um, well, I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, 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 scientists have been remarkably rude to philosophers. Uh, there seems to be no rule against being rude to philosophers over the years. Uh, but, you know, uh, that doesn't bother me that much. Uh, and I just like to point out that there's no, there's no philosophy free science. Uh, if you're going to be a scientist, you're taking on all sorts of philosophical assumptions. Now you may take them on in an unguarded, unthoughtful way, and you may get lucky. Maybe, maybe you'll be lucky enough so that all of your scientific, your all of your philosophical. Um, predispositions and attitudes and assumptions turn out to be safe. But that would be quite lucky on your part. Uh, and I've always been fascinated to see who the scientists are who will take on a philosopher, take a philosopher seriously and, and say, no, I, all right, I want to get this right. I'm willing to do a little arm wrestling with you on these topics. And some of my heroes, in fact, almost all of my heroes, are people who take philosophy that seriously. And sometimes their misreadings of philosophy are more, more important, more fruitful than the, than the official uh, readings of the philosophy departments. Uh, Richard Gregory was one of those. Um, uh, Francis Crick, uh, was willing to talk to philosophers and it w was great fun to, uh, sort of catch him by the tail every now and then. <laughs> I once had a discussion with him, uh, when I said, now, now, wait a minute, uh, Francis, if I understand you right, you're saying that if we had the right neurons uh, kept alive in a Petri dish and stimulated them, there would be consciousness of red in the Petri dish. And he said, hmm, hmm. He <laughs> said, well, yes, I guess there would be. I said, do you really want to maintain that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it... it he he uh, adjusted his view accordingly. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so on this role of luck, let's just go through some of your early childhood experiences. I didn't know the story about your father killed in a plane crash. You had some early mentors in high school. You have a, a digression of music and mathematics and, and, and so forth. So just kind of give us a sense of how you pinged around and ended up in philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would love to have been a musician or a mathematician <laughs> or an artist, but I discovered people who were so much better at that than I was. And I thought, well, I will lean on them. I'll learn from them. I'll be an amateur in those fields. And philosophy seemed to be the one thing that I could do pretty well. Uh, and... Uh, but only by not doing it the way a lot of a lot of philosophers do. Um, it was my uh, uh, budding career as as a sculptor which taught me the difference. Uh, we sculptors get to nibble away at what we're doing, and we can keep, you know, chipping and reshaping and sanding and buffing till we get it the way we like it. Not so uh, 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 a drafts person who has to get the line right, has to have a beautiful hand right from the beginning. You get, if you can't get it right on the first stab, don't even try. You're not going to be an artist. Sculptors are different in that way. And so uh, I view myself as a philosophical sculptor, nibbling away, roughing it out, turning the object around in my mind, thinking, 
I don't know. There's this bump here that doesn't feel right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about what might be better to put in that place. And I think that's a good way of doing philosophy. Here's the advice you offer to youngsters here. Don't worry too much about your IQ or how fast you can compose an objection. Add a few more tools to your kit and learn how to use them, and you'll soon be able to avoid digging yourself deeper into the trenches your warring colleagues are stuck in. You do take a risk when you stay out of the trenches. You tend to appear a mere amateur, someone who can be safely ignored, a popularizer of journalists, not a specialist. So you've kind of risked it uh, writing popular trade books. Oh, yeah. Um, and did you get pushback from your colleagues? Like, oh, he's, you know, can't be taken seriously. I, writing I did, but, but, it, but it's, it's sort of amusing to me because <clears throat> I realized that in, let's, let's say, my two most ambitious books, Consciousness Explained and Darwin's Dangerous Idea, I was really writing those for scientists, but I, my but my uh, decoy audience was the general educated public, because what I realized was that that's the right level for everybody. Uh, scientists, when they talk to each other, they tend to have the sin of under-explaining, which makes good sense. They don't want to insult their colleagues, especially in another field. So they deliberately under-explain, assume more shared knowledge than is there, and the result, they talk past each other. And I thought, no, the right way to do it is to, is to uh, have an audience of undergraduates or lay people and explain it to them while the other expert listens, eavesdrops. And very often, I mean very often, that other expert says, oh, that's what you mean. Now I get it. Yeah. And, and so uh, the whole, whole battles can be brought to an end sometimes by getting people simply to take turns explaining in each other's hearing to some uninitiated folks what the issues are. So, but I, I do pay a price for that. Interestingly enough, I pay a bigger price among philosophers, I think, than scientists. The scientists get it, they appreciate it, and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, the response of scientists to my work, uh, my trade book, my popular books, has been uh, very serious, very deep, very gratifying. But a lot of philosophers just write me off as, oh, he used to be a philosopher, but now he's, he's just a journalist. And, and uh, I think that's... Um, that just shows their insecurity as philosophers. Uh, it's, if you're a philosopher, it, there's plenty of grounds for insecurity if you're a philosopher. And I think a lot of them have to gird themselves with some kind of official, uh, uh, what should we say, technical prowess and rules. And you got to do it... <clears throat> You have to play by these very specific rules, and that's the only way to make any progress in philosophy. And I view that as uh, uh, just tying your hands behind your back. Yeah. People, yeah. when they make a philosophical mistake, it's not because they're stupid. It's because they got a bad habit of thought. Something, they got a little prejudice. They just can't see something. And... The way to get them to see it is not to bash them over the head with formal arguments. It's to try a little story, try a little example, try a little humor. See if you can't jump them out of their, out of their rut. And so I engage in a lot of that. I think of you as a scientist philosopher, because I know a lot of scientists and they very much admire and respect you. You're like their philosopher. And I happen to know you, so, but I don't know if it's the availability heuristic here. I, are you unusual in being so steeped in science? Are there other philosophers? Or... I'm happy to say that the, the core of, of science-educated philosophers is growing apace. And there are lots of young scientists who know much more about the brain than I do, much more about artificial intelligence than I do, much more about psychology and linguistics. And... 
a lot of them are my students or grand students, but a lot of them are just, they've done this on their own. And I delight in seeing them in action. I particularly delight in seeing scientists take them seriously. And uh, uh, it's not that I want to be a scientist. <laughs> I'm very happy. I live, I live in the best of both worlds. I, I, I get the, the results of all the labs, and I don't have to do the dishes. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, they, they let me kibitz and, and ask questions and give advice, and that sometimes they let me design experiments. It's great fun. And as again, I don't have to do the dishes. <laughs> nice, yeah. Well, our mutual agent there, John Brockman, you talk about him in your book. You know, he has this idea of third culture books, bridging CP, yeah, those yeah. Two, two cultures. And I think of books like Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. By the exactly. way, all of, his, all of his books start off, each chapter is a lecture in a class at UCLA. And, and that's how he, he starts off, and he does that several semesters. So by the time we read it, this has been hashed out in his classes and gotten good feedback. And I, I dare say there's undergraduates in those classes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. That, that's the key. Graduate students, if you, if you only teach graduate seminars, you'll never get your feet held to the fire uh, because they're too afraid of saying something stupid. <laughs> and, uh, but the, it's the freshmen and sophomores who say, hey, wait a minute, I don't get it. Right. Those are the ones you want. Yeah, so Guns, Germs, and Steel, that's not the pop version of the technical uh, papers he's written. That's the only version there is. Same thing, Selfish Gene. You know, this is Richard's original contribution can be read by anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And and was highly influential in evolutionary absolutely. theory. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think of your books that way, third culture books, that's hard to do. I think a lot of people can't, they don't do it because they can't do it. It's hard, to, it's hard to write for two audiences. Well, Yes, it is, but my crutch is to write for one audience, write undergraduates. And if I can't explain it to them, I don't understand it. And uh, I think that would be uh, a very useful therapeutic exercise for many philosophers. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to seg us into one of your major contributions in the field on free will and determinism by reading a passage from your book here. You say, I believe in free will in a non-magical sense that really matters. I think those who do good in the world deserve praise and rewards, and those who do evil deserve to be punished if they are competent, self-controlling adults. I also believe that this kind of free will is not threatened by determinism and have devoted three books and dozens of articles to defending this initially counterintuitive claim. I liked your uh, Freedom Evolves, the best of those. Uh, determinism is the claim that there is at any instant exactly one possible future, but this does not imply inevitability. I think you made the point between inevitability and inevitability. And, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, we and other autonomous agents avoid things every day. Determinism doesn't tie your hands, nor does it prevent you from making and then reconsidering decisions, turning over a new leaf, learning from your mistakes. Determinism is not a puppeteer controlling you. If you're a normal adult, you have enough self-control to maintain your autonomy and hence responsibility in a world full of seductions and distractions. <laughs> but even if I'm right that determinism is no threat to responsibility or autonomy, this wouldn't settle the question of whether or not I'm just a preternaturally lucky person who has made the most of the good fortune that has been my lot. So there your reference to, um, you know, not, not fully functioning adults. Let's say somebody has a tumor. Yeah. Like, uh, like the example of Mr. Oft in Adrian Rain's book, The Anatomy of Violence. Mr. Oft has a tumor in his orbital yeah, frontal yeah. cortex. And, he, you know, oh, he's not a pedophile. He's got a tumor. So they take the tumor out. And he no longer has the pedophilic feelings. And it comes back. And he's, the wife finds kitty porn on his computer. Oh, no. Scan the brain. The tumor's back. But Adrian's point is, but we don't feel like that guy's a, pedophile we feel like oh he's got a tumor so then he goes into a whole um, litany about uh, Donta Page this African American uh, man who killed mur raped murdered a young woman in Colorado 
Adrian was on the defense um, uh, team to get, get, him, get him life sentence rather than capital punishment. And he argued that this guy's background is so bad. And he spends like three pages, dropped on his head multiple times, and single mom, crack addict, and on and on, running with gangs, violence, and horrible diet, horrible home environment. And on and on, you kind of feel sorry for the guy by the time you get there. Anyway, Adrian's point is that you can't see any tumors in the brain scan. But there, what's the difference between Mr. Off with his tumor and this poor young man who had the horrible background? It's tumors all the way down. So what's the difference between that and 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 so somebody like uh, Sam Harris or um, Robert Sapolsky, who has a new book out called Determined, would say, Dan, it's tumors all the way down. You just can't see all the little contingencies <laughs> in your life, <laughs> even the belly in your fi the fire in your belly. That's just ju that's just hormones and neurons firing and so on. Well, <laughs> I, I like the way you put it very much, Michael, because I think you you. Uh... I guess maybe deliberately um, put your finger on the the, uh, the mistake that 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 Sapolsky say is making there, um, and Sam Harris makes it too. No, it's not tumors all the way down; it's machinery all the way down. But there's good machinery and there's bad machinery, and if we have bad machinery, then yes, then we're disabled to some degree. But what about people who have good machinery? They're not disabled. Why can't we hold them responsible? Now, some people are, alas, through no fault of their own, not responsible for what they do. And that might well include people with terrible, terrible youths who didn't get a good upbringing, who had a horrific upbringing. And so we have to, as society, we have to decide Okay, given that this is a dangerous person, what's the humane good thing to do? Uh, don't think there's an algorithm or a, or a bright line for distinguishing somebody whose brain is good enough from somebody whose brain is uh, a little too uh, disabled. We just have to make this. We do it all the time. <laughs> you you got to you got to be sixteen to get a driver's license. Some fifteen-year-olds would be perfectly safe as drivers. Some twenty-one-year-olds would not. <laughs> but the law has to has to have a bright line, and so it chooses one. We might argue whether we want to raise it or lower it. The way the drinking age has been raised or lowered, or the way the driving age has been raised or lowered. We have to have a policy, and we have to stick to it, and we can change it as we learn more and more. But what we don't do is just say, oh, it's it's disability all the way. No, no, you're not disabled. I'm not disabled. I want to be held responsible. I think you want to be held responsible, too. And I, I think, you know, as Sapolsky, I think he probably wants to have the royalties from his book. <laughs> And uh, maybe he doesn't. Maybe maybe he's donating those all to charity or something. But I think I think he wants to take responsibility for his own work. I certainly want to take responsibility for mine. It's it, the reason people I think get confused about this is that my fellow philosophers have engaged in in what you might call free will inflation for several thousand years. There's a really important reason why we want our decision making to be private. <clears throat> it's it's a it's a reason that was pointed out by von Morgenstern and von Neumann, Morgenstern and von Neumann in the mathematical theory of games. If your decision making is an open book, you're just turned into a money pump. Uh, anybody who comes along can can simply take advantage of you by knowing what your preferences are and what your beliefs are. So it's very important. Transparency is not good in this situation. You don't want your mind to be transparent to others because by keeping your mind opaque to others, you maintain self-control. And if you don't have self-control, then you're not a responsible agent. Somebody else may be is using you as a puppet.
okay, this would be your degrees of freedom then, the guy with the Absolutely. tumor. Absolutely. The guy with the tumor, the horrible childhood, has fewer degrees of freedom <clears throat> than you and I who have a, mm. a nice childhood. Yeah. And, and you know, and that's, that's why, we, to put it bluntly, that's why we don't hold bears responsible for mm. murder when they, when they kill something. They don't have enough degrees of freedom. They can't anticipate, they can't think about what they're doing in a way a, a normal uh, uh, human being can. Yeah. Uh, well, I just, just read Robert's book and had him on, on the show. Here's what the, I think the deeper theme is of his work in that book is not free will determinism. It's, uh, and he tells a story on the opening pages of being at the graduation ceremony at Stanford. And he's sitting there watching the pomp and circumstance and all the parents and grandparents, everybody's happy and so on. And off in the far distance background is a gardener, just a guy picking up the garbage, trimming the, he's like, how come that guy it has a life of being a groundskeeper and he's not graduating from Stanford? And then he kind of dissects that. Well, because, you know, when he was in the second trimester in his mother's womb, you know, she smoked cigarettes or she did, did this. And, and then she married somebody, got divorced. And then this happened, this happened. And, you know, he just has this background that's not the same as the Stanford graduate who was raised in by two parents in a home full of books, went to these private schools, got great nutrition and on and on and, you know, a thousand different things. And so Robert senses the world's not fair. And it's not fair for us to, you know, feel so much pride. I graduated from Stanford. I did this on my own. No, you didn't. You had these thousand little things that the gardener guy didn't have. Anyway, that's that's what. That's well, take. there's much that I agree with there. The world's not fair. The world's not fair, but we, we, lucky, well-equipped well-functioning human beings can make it fairer. And that's one of the great things that we've done. We've made it fairer. We've, we've made civilization so that people who otherwise might be just trampled or robbed or, or, or raped or, or, or enslaved, <laughs> We've made the world safer for them, but the price for that is having rules, is having laws. Law and order, it's... <laughs> law and order is not a bad thing. <laughs> when, I, you... when, I see, when I see the, um, oh, the, you know, the MAGA crowd, uh, I think, let them live in a failed state for a few years <laughs> and see if they want to be See if they want to maintain the same attitudes. Uh, the the um, I think somebody, if somebody hasn't done it, somebody should do a study of comparing the political views of those who have passports and have been abroad and those who haven't. Mm. And I think you'll find that the the people who've never 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 left the United States uh, and don't want to leave the United States have really pinched perspectives on all of this and they're all for for freedom in the great frontier and the wild west they have no idea how terrifying it is to live in a failed state or just in a state where they are at the mercy of corrupt bosses and police and and uh, corrupt leaders uh this is a very precious and very fragile thing, and we should and we should uh, uh, do what we can to uh, maintain it. Would you include in this social programs to help people at the bottom to pull them up so they're absolutely. not absolutely so okay, absolutely, sure. Um, uh, uh, public education, Head Start programs, food stamps, uh, child care. America's way behind in these compared with some of our civilized European neighbors, uh, cousins, friends. Um, if, if the people in this country who, who don't appreciate, if they could just see the quality of life, right down to and including the infrastructure in, in, 
Denmark or, or, or Sweden or, or, or England or Germany. They'd have a different, they'd have a different view of, we're lagging behind and we're lagging behind because somehow I think we stopped teaching civics well or something and people grow up with <laughs> distorted ideas of their responsibilities as citizens, not just their rights, but their responsibilities as citizens. Here, I think you might share some of Robert Sapolsky's views on punishment, capital punishment, the prison system, the judicial system, and so on. It's very Old Testament. <laughs> right? we, gotta, we have to have retributive <coughs> justice and punish these people. Well, uh, at, yeah. You know, um, first, let me say, I just received the PDF of Sapolsky's book yesterday, and so I haven't had a chance to read it. I'm not, I'm not a speed reader. Uh, but I have a pretty good sense of what's in there. Uh, retribution is, I think, a curiously misunderstood and misused word. Um, uh, uh, I'm not a retributivist, but I do believe in responsibility and in blame and in punishment. And I've tried to explain this with a series of careful thought experiments. And uh, Greg Caruso and I have a little, little book on this called Just Desserts, which is all about this topic. And I'm going to give you very my, my simple example, but it's a, toy, it's a toy problem. Sometimes toy problems are what you want to look at. Who would like to eliminate the red card and the yellow card from soccer, football? <laughs> Who would like to eliminate personal fouls from basketball or football? No. No. You can't. You need, and you need to have meaningful punishments for those. And it's as simple as that. Society but, but is, the, is the punishment yeah. utilitarian to change future behavior, or is it, you know, ah, it, it's, is it, yeah. it's utilitarian in one sense. It's it's justified by its con. It's a consequentialist view, but it's but you don't do this case at a time. You have the rule, and then you stick to the rule. The last thing. Look, there you are, you're the umpire, and there's a rookie at bat, and he's got two strikes, and his mother and father are watching, and the pitch comes in, and it's in the strike zone. Do we want the umpire cheating, in effect, and saying, ball one? <laughs> no, no, we want the umpire to call balls and strikes, honestly. That's, otherwise they just spoil the game. If we want to go on playing baseball and football and basketball and chess and bridge, play by the rules. So it's a game. Rules play, have an important role to play yeah. in human Cooperation. And let me just add one more thing. Goodhart's law. Very important law. Goodhart's law is that when a symptom becomes a target, it ceases to be a good symptom. Wherever you have rules, wherever you have targets that are being sought after as good substitutes for some good, Somebody's going to try to game the system. So we should expect there's going to be a continuing arms race of people gaming the system if they can. We, you see it in sports. You see it in, in uh, uh, basketball players taking dives on the court to get fouls called against them. You, um, you, see, it, you see it everywhere. We have to get used to the fact that, yeah, just because you've got rules doesn't mean that people won't be motivated to break them. But 
we may have to change the rules. We may have to enforce the rules, but don't be shocked or surprised and don't abandon rules because people want to break them. Keep rules because yeah. people want to break them. So Sapolsky's so counter to that would be, you said, you don't punish the bear for killing somebody. You shouldn't punish the serial killer for killing people. They're, they're a victim of their horrible backgrounds or whatever. Just, just the same as the bear is victim to his nature. So he proposes a quarantine system. Let's just quarantine these people. I guess prison would be this, the solution there. Uh, and see if we can figure out what the problem was and fix it and then let them out once it's fixed. Oh, and if we sure. can't fix it, then don't let them out. Yeah, well, that's very much like like Greg Caruso's quarantine system, but of course it doesn't work unless you have punishment in the background. Mm, yeah, how are you going to pe get people to go into quarantine? What if they say no, I'm not going into quarantine? <laughs> well, you you send men with guns. Exactly. <laughs> so you're not going to get you're not going to get rid of coercion or or the threat of violence. Uh, uh, the quarantine system absolutely won't work and isn't even really a good idea, I think, in the end. Um, uh, I, I give Greg Caruso an example where um, you know, I do something. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how does it matter how my example is. I, I, I make a fuss in the neighborhood and, and, and uh, uh, he wants to, you know, charge me with disturbing the peace or something like that. And he wants to, um, uh, and I just take the pill and says, no, all right, won't do it anymore. Um, is he happy with that? No, no, <laughs> he's not going to be happy with that. Um, uh, like it or not, as I've said to the shock of many people, I don't want to live in a world without punishment. For the same reason, I don't want to play football in without a world rules. without penalties. I don't want to play hockey in a world without with, without a penalty box. <laughs> uh, there are good reasons why societies have to have systems of punishment. The one we have is obscene. And it's obscene because it's been elevated by all sorts of retributive nonsense. The ideal for a system of punishment is where when you punish the person punished, the person who's punished says, thanks, I needed that. That's an ideal, hard, hard to achieve, but sometimes it's possible and that's just what we need. Yeah. Seems to me the whole thing turns on, could you have done otherwise? This is your distinction between inevitability and inevitability. Let me tee this up for you, like I did for uh, Robert. Uh, this is based on how he and Sam both define determinism. Here is Sapolsky. We are nothing more or less than the cumulative biological and environmental luck over which we had no control that has brought us to any moment. Here's Sam. Our wills are simply not of our own making. Thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which we are unaware and over which we exert no conscious control. We do not have the freedom we think we have. Okay, so here's my thought experiment <laughs> for both of them, and I haven't really gotten a good uh, response to this. Uh, let me see, where is this here? Um, yes, okay, so... Um, see, where is it? Oh, yeah, so uh, John Doe um, is married to Jane Doe, and they're happily married, and the chances of him cheating on her are very low, but they're not zero because he's human. And so one night on uh, he's on a business trip, and, well, he slips up, and she finds out that, that he had an affair. How is this for his explanation to Jane? Honey, my will is simply not of my own making. <laughs> my thoughts <laughs> and intentions emerge from background causes of which I'm unaware and over which I exert <laughs> no conscious control. Yeah. I don't have the freedom you think I have. I could not have done otherwise because I am nothing more or less than the cumulative biological environmental luck over which I had no control that brought me to that moment of infidelity. Could even finish the sentence before Jane slapped him across the face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because no, of course he yeah, could have done otherwise. Yes, yes, I, I, think that's, I think that's a good example. And I think that... Um, uh,
I think that we have to recognize that we're not responsible for being responsible. We're lucky to be responsible. But once we're responsible, we're responsible for staying responsible. Once, once you have the competence, once you have the can-do, once you've got the self-control, then you get two things. You get the freedom of the state. You get to sign contracts. You get to earn royalties. You get to, you, you get to go where you want to. You get to get a passport and so forth and so on. You get to get married. The price you pay for that is your willingness to be uh, punished for any violations of laws that you make. It's a great bargain. It's a great deal. It's the best game in town. And, and you, we've got to think of free will as an achievement, not a metaphysical endowment. We, we, we weren't born with free will. The little baby doesn't have the self-control. They get self-control pretty much unless they have a, a horrific childhood. They get self-control. They learn from their mistakes. They overcome their obstacles. Not in every case. We want to leave plenty of room for people who are, who are disabled. But a key fact, if you look at, at I haven't read Sapolsky's book, but if you look at, at um, uh, Sam Harris's little book on free will, he he runs out the 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 serial killer, the person with the brain tumor. Right? Yeah, those people are disabled. They don't have free will, but that doesn't mean nobody has free will. It does seem to me it turns on that could he have done otherwise? Let me back into this again yeah. through your Darwin's dangerous idea uh, running uh, discussion. Stephen Jay Gould's idea of if you replayed the tape of life, would we be here again? And you make the point, well, if it's a read-only memory tape, it's a literal recording of what happened, then yes, it would happen exactly the way it did, because uh, it's just re it, just playing back <clears throat> the, the actual events. So I think, um, you know, when Jane slaps John and says, you better not do this again, the assumption is there can be similar circumstances. You're on the road, you meet somebody at the bar, but this time you remembered, oh yeah, I really fucked up last time, and you know, I don't want to hurt my wife again because she's going to divorce me, so I'm not going back to my room with this woman. End of story. He did do otherwise, because the future is never yeah. exactly yeah. like the past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one, of my, one of my students put it pretty much that way, said, uh, well, maybe I couldn't do otherwise then, but I'll do otherwise in the future. Right. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of how we tell whether something has control. And the Steve Gould rerun the tape doesn't tell you that. If you, if you have a videotape of a stone rolling down a mountain and you play exactly the same tape over and over and over, you'll never be able to tell what, whether that stone was under the, in control. It wasn't. It was just rolling down the mountain. If you vary the circumstances ever so slightly, it'll roll down the mountain different way each time. You take a an accomplished skier going down the slalom course, and she'll go down almost in exactly the same tracks every time, no matter whether the wind is blowing or the sun is set or, or she's tired. That's control. Control is the key, and control precisely depends on not thinking of determinism as rewinding the tape. We're not interested in whether we could have done otherwise in exactly the same instance. What we are interested in, for good reason, is whether we would do the same in slightly varying conditions. This is one of the great mistakes in philosophy, I think, and I, I like to attribute it to J.L. Austin, the great John Austin in Oxford who talks about missing a putt on the golf course. And he says, you know, I could have made it. I could have made it. And when he says that, he says, I don't mean if I tried harder. I mean, 
I could have made it, and, and, and experiments could prove it. What experiments does he have in mind? Quantum mechanical experiments? No. What he has in mind, obviously, although he doesn't say so, is lining up the putt, roughly the same putt 10 times in a row, and he thinks it 9 out of 10 times. But conditions aren't the same in those. They're different each, each time. It's a little later. There's a little more dew. The ball is soggier. He's tired. You know, somebody laughs. All of these other things going on. That's the kind of competence. The only way to measure competence is by looking at varying conditions, not conditions as they exactly were. Who cares what conditions were at exactly that moment? The thesis of determinism is just irrelevant to the question of control and competence. So would that assume then that the universe is not predetermined from the Big Bang to the to the end, where it's like a block universe, it's all already happened and we're in the slice, the No, movie. it doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't follow either. I mean, uh, I'm prepared to say, look, determinism can be true. That still doesn't show that there isn't a difference between things that are in control and things that aren't. But wouldn't that presuppose it's not predetermined? Where an outside agent would know what you're going to do, even if you don't. Ah, an outside agent. <laughs> many, many years ago, Donald Mackay had wrote a much neglected paper, although I cited it way back in 1984, uh, on the logical indeterminacy of a free choice. He pointed out uh, Laplace's demon that knows everything in a determined world still can't tell you, can't tell you, and can't intervene. And that's the difference. Uh, if you're worried about determinism controlling you, you you're, that's just a category mistake. Determinism is not an agent. There's no feedback to the past. The rolling stone rolling down the mountain is determined to roll where it is, but it's not controlled. To be controlled is to be under the, the effectual influence of some controller that has foresight and that is gathering information about the trajectory. No, that's the difference you want. And it's simply independent of determinism. Nice. All right, let's talk about one of your other great uh, areas of uh, research on consciousness. Um, again, reading your memoir, Dan, uh, you remind, it reminds me of Forrest Gump. You always seem to be at the right place at the right time for the greatest <laughs> ideas and events with the most yeah. interesting people. <laughs> it's oh, yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> so one of these moments, uh, I recall, uh, at the TED 2014, I think it was in Vancouver, where David Chalmers gave his uh, you know, Hard Problem of Consciousness uh, lecture. Yep. I was in there, you were in the audience, and then I went up to him afterwards in the little uh, area outside the lecture hall, and I was chatting it up with him. And you walked up and you said to him something like, you know, David, that was the best lecture I've ever heard you give articulating the hard problem of consciousness. And he had this look in his face like, oh my gosh, the great Dan Dennett just praised me. This is... And then you <laughs> let the other shoe drop. Now I know exactly why you're wrong <laughs> or something to that effect. <laughs> and then yeah. he was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I meant it. I meant it too. I meant it. Um, yeah. Um, David and I have been sparring, but in, a, I think, a constructive and friendly way now oh, for yeah. many years. Uh, actually, I, I knew him when he was a graduate student of Doug Hofstadter's and Doug and I, I was informally on his thesis committee and uh, didn't believe the conclusions of his thesis, but in philosophy, that's not required <laughs> for getting the PhD. Neither did Doug, but, but he'd, he'd been, he, the scholarship was excellent, outstanding. He, he uh, dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's, and, and looked at all the plausible uh, escape hatches from the argument he was developing. I just didn't agree with a lot of his work. Mm. Well, I see so, Christoph, Christoph Koch has paid uh, David uh, 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 the wager they made 25 years ago, a, a case of wine, yes. that the hard yes. problem would be solved by now. It hasn't. Is it just we need another 25 more years? Is it no, insoluble? It's the, it's, no, it's that the hard problem doesn't exist. Okay. Plain. 
as, as I, I, I did a little video framing of that wager, I couldn't be in New York for the meeting, so I sent them a little video, which they ran. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. But um, uh, where uh, I compared the settling of this bet to one of my favorite episodes in Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and that's where, where Winnie the Pooh finds the North Pole. They go on an expotition, and they come up with this stick, and they decide that's the North Pole. They're just looking in the wrong place. They're asking the wrong questions. So, uh, yeah, of course, David won, um, but not because there's a hard problem. Uh, they're both... One of my rules of thumb, as I tell my, my students, for, for when you see people at loggerheads like this, is find something that they both agree about that they're not talking about and try try negating that, try denying that, and you very often come up with a solution. And the fact is, both David and Christoph believe in phenomenal properties. They believe in qualia. And they're just wrong. Nothing fulfills the category of the philosopher's technical item. Of quality. Of course, are there pains? Are there aromas? Of course there are. But they're not the qualia that create the hard problem. In fact, David almost acknowledges that because he wrote another paper called The Meta Problem, which was basically why, why do human beings have this problem with the hard problem? And the answer is the same. It's because they're, they're they're making this this mistake of of thinking that they are authoritative about what's going on in their own minds. They're not. And as soon as you as soon as you recognize that, you can point to the places in their arguments where they go afoul. I've been arguing with Christoph about this for years. In fact, we had a, I don't think I tell this story in the book, but uh, uh, a young medical student at Berkeley decided to write a book about controversy in the area of neuroscience and consciousness. And among the people she wanted to tag along with to see how he did business was me. And uh, you want to come visit my lab? Well, I don't have a lab, of course. But so we went to the um, uh, meeting of the ASSC, and it was it was in Nashville. And Christoph and I arranged to have a dinner, where we'd go over our remaining points of disagreement. And she came along with her with her recorder, and uh, recorded the whole thing. Well, I'll tell you, it was funny because it was a steakhouse in Nashville, and uh, Christoph and I got quite worked up. And I think we almost drove the other patrons of the restaurant out because we went out at hammer and tongs for about an hour and a half. Wow. And, and uh, uh, if you if you want to read all about that exchange, it's in a book called The Three Pound Enigma. Uh, I can't, at the moment, I can't remember the author's name. Nice, smart person. I don't know what's happened to her since then. But um, uh, Christoph's can't get it out of his head that pains cannot be explained just functionally, just in terms of behavior and wanting to not be in pain and so forth. There has to be this extra quale, this extra something or other, this awfulness. And we just went round and round on this. My, my favorite thought experiment against him against his view to try to get him to see otherwise was, um, Christoph, here are two pills. I'm going to suppose you have a, you know, terrible migraine. Here's, here's two pills you can take. Um, one of them, uh, it erases the quality of pain. But, you can't concentrate, you can't do your work, 
you can barely hold a conversation, you can't sleep, uh, uh, you're, you keep thinking about the agony you're in and so forth. That's pill number one. Pill number two it simply wipes out all those sequelae. Now, which pill do you want? And uh, if there is this extra magic ingredient, who cares? I want absence of all the distracting and annoying and thwarting. I want, I want to be able to go on doing what I want to do. and I don't want to be interrupted. Pain is a great interrupt system. And that's why pain matters. It's, an, it's not because anything intrinsically matters. This is another way it's sometimes put. I mean, for instance, by, by, by Tom Nagel. You know, intrinsic pain. No such thing. It's this idea of intrinsic properties of experience that matter, but they don't matter functionally. No. If it doesn't matter functionally, it doesn't matter. That's... That's why the whole idea of a philosophical zombie is such an embarrassing mistake. A philosophical zombie is just like you and me, except there's no inner life, there's no qualia inside. But, but you know, if you want to bother a philosophical zombie, just threaten him. <laughs> just, just punch right. him in the nose. Right. Uh, he won't feel pain, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but you might get punched uh, back. <laughs> you might get punched back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the the whole idea of a philosophical zombie that's just behaviorally indistinguishable from you and me, but there's no inside life. There's no Cartesian theater where the show's going on. And that's one of the silliest ideas I've ever encountered. But it's amazing yeah. how popular it still is with philosophers. I can remember one philosopher. I can't remember who it was. Who said, Dan. Do you think that anybody who takes philosophical zombies seriously should, you know, put a paper bag over his head just to conceal their embarrassment? I said, yeah, I think it's a pretty good idea. <laughs> yeah, I solved that problem by applying the Copernican principle, we're not special, to myself. I'm not special. So if I see you expressing similar uh, emotions that I yeah, feel, yeah. it's a safe bet that I'm not the only one who's sentient. You're probably feeling the same thing. Yeah, that's, yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, you mentioned uh, Nagel. Let's talk about is what it's like to be a bat. I like I just change it to dolphin, you know, because I've swum with dolphins. Okay, so if I had big flippers and I had a slightly more fusiform body and maybe I bolted on some big ears and and a, and a little a vibrating thing that sent uh, uh, sound waves out and bounced back and you know I kind of get a sense of what it's like. But at some point, here I apply Aristotle's uh, you know law of identity. Uh, you know, if I was if I had all the experiences of a dolphin. I would just be a dolphin. I wouldn't be a human realizing what it's like to be a dolphin. <laughs> exactly. It yeah. seems like a, a form of dualism, like the little homunculus in my head could go over to the dolphin's head and go, yeah. oh, it's... so that's what it's like. Yeah. In fact, um, Doug Hofstadter and I reprinted Nagel's What Is It Like to Be a Bat in our collection, The Mind's Eye. And Doug wrote a, I think, brilliant commentary on that where he made just that point, you know. This this idea that you could be that that the exercise of imagination that Nagel is is discussing is coherently described is just a mistake. Uh, uh, and, and I tried to make the point by saying the reason we can't imagine what it's like to be a dolphin is not that we don't know enough; it's that we know too much. We, you have to, if you want to know what it's like to be a bat, first of all, you have, you're going to have to forget all your human knowledge. Right. But then, when you forget all your human knowledge, of course, then you, you won't even be motivated to wonder what it's like to be a bat. I don't think bat, bats wonder what it's like to be a bat. I don't think they can. And, yeah. and that's a huge difference between their minds and ours. Uh, so, it's a, it, it's a dual, not only dualism, but essentialism, 
Yeah. Uh, Paul Bloom makes this point, you know, we're kind of natural born duelists and essentialists. And the reason we enjoy movies like uh, Freaky Friday, where Lindsay Lohan yeah, and yeah, Jamie yeah. Lee Curtis switch bodies, you know, it's because we're natural duelists, but, you know, it's a ridiculous idea. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or, you know, Kafka's Metamorphosis, where he wakes yeah. up as a cockroach or whatever he is. This is yeah. still just flawed dualism. You're right. Um, dualism and essentialism go hand in hand. And uh, we could trace them both back to Plato if we wanted to, to Socrates or Descartes. Uh, some of the distinguished philosophical forebears have foisted some bad ideas on us. Uh, for Democritus, it was the random swerve picked up by Lu uh, Lucretius. And uh, uh, yeah, we've philosophers tend to uh, inflate topics. It's a sort of Maginot line mentality. This is so important. I'm going to, I'm going to make it super duper duper important. <laughs> and then they inflate it to where it's indefensible. Here's what uh, Steven Pinker wrote about this in his enlightenment. Now this whole discussion, our best science tells us that consciousness consists of a global workspace representing our current goals, memories, and surroundings implemented in synchronized neural firing in fronto parietal circuitry. But the last dollop in the theory that it subjectively feels like something to be such circuitry may have to be stipulated as a fact about reality where explanation stops. I wish I could talk Steve out of that. I've tried. Yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, he's right. I read up to the end. I think he's still, uh, a little bit mesmerized by the, by the idea of qualia and the hard problem. And, uh, I and Keith Frankish and Nick Humphrey have been trying to show that that's not what's going on in your head. I mean, you don't have qualia in there. And and the the way to make sense of that is the po little reductio ad absurdum argument. All right, suppose there were qualia. Suppose there was this medium in your head where the qualia happened. Uh, do you notice them? Uh, do you react to them? If you don't, then what are they doing? And if you do, then what we really need to talk about is your reactions. And then what happens? How do you, how do you respond to these imaginary, uh, phantom intrinsic properties? It's the responses that matter. That's why there's, that's why there's the whole idea of, actually, the, 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 the philosophical zombie idea is, I think, a brilliant um, distillation of what's wrong. <laughs> it's, that's the bad idea. The idea that there's a difference between a zombie, a philosopher's zombie, and a conscious being. No. Where the zombie, where you, ex hypothesize have a stream of consciousness with all those delicious qualia, intrinsic properties, the philosophical zombie has a stream of unconsciousness. And the stream of unconsciousness does everything <laughs> that the stream of consciousness does. Come on. We just, we got... One one entity more than you need. It almost Hawkins sounds like a, replies. a Skinnerian behaviorism. Like we can't speculate what's in the. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. It's not so much Skinnerian behaviorism as scientific behaviorism. Of course, that's what science is. It's behaviorism. Nobody says those meteorologists. They're just behaviors. Yeah. Once you've explained all the climate behavior, you've explained it all. There's nothing left. And same with consciousness. So when we word, use words like mind or 
descriptions like, oh, she remembered or he figured it out. These are just, I guess, proxy words we're using to describe something we don't really understand inside. Well, no, it's, it's what we're doing is adopting the intentional stance, one of my favorite yeah, terms. Nice. And indeed, it's the strategy that works. And in fact, it evolved. It's one of the user-friendly tools in our kit that we get from evolution. When we see something complicated, our first reaction is, who's there? Who's there? Why? Who? What do you want? What do you know? Can you see me? It's this curiosity about what this complicated moving thing wants and knows that keeps us alive. And it's just been elevated and exploited in a thousand and one ways. It's, it explains literature and humor and art and music. We have this whole set of categories that we've evolved through conversation. Most of it's actually cultural evolution, not genetic evolution. And we are higher order intentional systems that have beliefs about beliefs and desires about desires and beliefs about desires about beliefs and so forth. And there's only a practical limit to how how many levels of that we can we can make sense of? Human beings are pretty good. I mean, you can go to a movie with a friend, and uh, uh, at some point, you're thinking to yourself as you as you or you say to your your fellow moviegoer, "Oh, she doesn't know." that he wants her to think that he doesn't know, but we don't have any trouble with that. We're the only species that can do that. Right. So instead of defining consciousness as what it's like to be something, and therefore the hard problem is impossible to answer, you're saying it's levels of awareness, awareness or meta-awareness and levels on top of levels. Yeah. And, but but how do you avoid the, the the idea that at some point you know the miracle happens that you know the magic yeah, kicks yeah, in exactly you just don't that's what you that's the whole point is we get we get rid of the place where and then the miracle happens okay all right it's all it's it's not infinite it's a finite nesting of recursive reactions many you could say look trees notice things. They notice when the trees around them are growing too fast and crowding them out and they have a little switch that turns in so they grow more vertical to try to catch up so that they can compete with the trees. That's noticing. But the trees can't notice they're noticing. And the, and the frog zapping the bug out of the air notices the bug, but it can't notice it's noticing of the bug we can notice our noticing of our noticing of our noticing and so forth. We are definite, indefinitely recursive in that way. And that's a big part of our minds. But it's not magic. And it's not infinite. And it doesn't require anything but the churning of trillions, trillions of moving parts. I mean, Descartes has this famous quote where he says why there, there couldn't be an effect to chat GPT. <laughs> you no, know, you, you can never make a, 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 you know, a machine that, that could have a conversation. Well, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but chat GPT is a long ways from his mechanical ducks in the French garden. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and I say, what you could... What you can imagine depends on what you know. And what you know, uh, that's why we have to do science. And, and Descartes, there were lots of things he just didn't know. He was an awfully smart guy, had a brilliant, he had a theory of everything. One of the first theories of everything inspired Newton to refute him. Mm hmm well and soundly, uh, uh, that's a good story in itself. Uh, yeah. How, how Descartes drove 
Newton to writing the Principia. Interesting. Uh, to set Descartes straight. Yeah. Uh, well, we all do that, right? We write a book to correct somebody else or push back or yeah, have yeah, a new yeah. idea. Yeah. Right. Okay. So speaking of which, uh, this is our good entry into evolutionary theory, adaptations versus acceptations, Stephen Jay Gould, all that stuff. Okay. So why do we have such a brain able to do this? You know, Alfred Russell Wallace made the point uh, in his debate with Darwin over this, that, you know, the difference between, say, a chimp brain and a human brain, you don't really need a human brain like ours. You, a chimp brain is all you need. Uh, and why do we have aesthetic appreciation and the ability to do mathematics and on and on? There's really no adaptive reason for this. Wallace was a hyper-adaptationist, and it, he could not think of what's the adaptive purpose of this there had to be some, you know, higher being or whatever, and, and Darwin rejected that. But what is your sense? What is, why do we have the ability to, why do we have meta layers on top of layers on top of, we don't need that. Is it just an acceptation of what Steve Gould calls a cheat, you know, cognitive cheesecake, you know, we just didn't need it, lucky us. Or was there some adaptive story you can tell to get us there? There's an adaptive story, but it's, not, but it's not the usual one. And as usual, people don't recognize it because they, they forget to make a fundamental point. Evolution doesn't depend on being alive. Viruses aren't alive, but they sure do evolve by natural selection. And so do ways of doing things. They evolve. The, what Dawkins calls memes. Words came on the picture. How did language evolve? That's a very interesting question, a long story to tell about. And we're, we're making the story better and better now that we're abandoning uh, Chomsky's Cartesian linguistics, well-named Cartesian, uh, and getting Darwinian linguistics, finally. Uh, and when language evolved, it was both, on the one hand, a great boon it's what made civilization possible, and science, and art, and music, and religion, and all that other good stuff. But it also complicated our lives. Now we had all these words that were infecting our heads, and they were hard to control. And so we've had the problem of how to handle the bounty that language gives us. How our, our heads are just teeming with ideas brought, born in on us by language. And it's hard to respond to that. And most of our responses are, by the way, not, I think, particularly, uh, uh, th th our responses aren't designed by so much by genetic mutation as by memetic mutation. We learn from school, from our friends, from our colleagues, from the radio, from the television, how to control our own thinking to the extent that we do. So consciousness is a sort of mixed bag. It, in some ways, it's an affliction. Yeah, what, what Wallace said, what, we don't need a brain bigger than a chimpanzee. Yeah, but once you go down that route, then you need it, and you need a lot more. So someone like we don't, Jeff we don't need we don't need radio or television either, but we've got them, and we got computers now, and now we're faced with huge problems of how to control the wonderful technology that we've invented. Okay, so someone like Jeffrey Miller, uh, the evolutionary psychologist, makes the argument that things like the ability to write poetry or, or, or be funny, have, have a good sense of humor, be an intelligent, uh, be creative, it has an adaptive purpose uh, for sexual selection. Mates prefer somebody who is smart and funny and kind and thoughtful and, you know, and, and, and all those features that, um, that seem inexplicable. He says, well, these are sexually selected. Others, evolutionary psycho, no, 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 it's an acceptation or it's just a, a spandrel. It's, we didn't really need it. It was evolved for some other purpose, and now we have it, and we apply it in these new areas like music and poetry and so on. Your thoughts? Well, I think there's a little bit of truth in that, and but then there's also some tricks that are being missed. Um, yeah, sure. 
Um, I think sexual selection has a big role to play here. Um, uh, and, and Jeffrey Miller isn't the only one who's argued this. Um, uh, Nick Humphreys argued, I think, uh, with considerable plausibility, that um, uh, the reason we have a sense of beauty, of, say, of artistic beauty, the reason that we can find a beautiful sunset or a beautiful vista is it's sort of upside down. It's because we first found beauty in art, in paintings, in decorations, in, 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 in artistic creation. And Jeffrey Miller's right about that. This was, this was sexual selection. These were mainly guys showing off like peacocks mm -hmm. to uh, peahens. Uh, these were guys try, uh, trying to impress women. And this theory, of course, sells probably a million guitars a year, uh, uh, mainly to young men. Right. But then some stars. of them decide they'd rather make music than love. And that's putting it crudely, but uh, uh, these things take on a life of their own. And that's the way it is with memes. We invent them for one purpose, and then they take over, and they and and they evolve on their own. They they may be bad for us. I think there's lots of socially pernicious and and uh, uh, deleterious memes that nevertheless are extremely attractive. And of course, one should never forget that if we think about adaptations as genetic fitness enhancers, then who cares about that? As, as Boyd and Richardson point out, if, say, eating broccoli had as strong a deleterious effect on your genetic fitness that it'd have to, as education does, it would have to have a warning label. <laughs> There's no question that the more education you get, the less, the less grandchildren you tend to have. There's lots of lots of evidence of that. Do we care? No. Why not? Because I don't know about you, but although I love my grandchildren dearly, I don't think that having more grandchildren than anybody else is the most important thing in life. But that's culture. That's culture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Culture. It's culture, of course. It's evolved cultural features that has turned the tide on the population bomb. Mm, yes. To mix right. my metaphors. <laughs> yes.